Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome, welcome, welcome. So depending where you are on the planet, uh, welcome, welcome to the Bull versus Bear webinar trade day here with Trade Day here. Steve Miley on the call on Monday, the 1st of August, kicking off a new month here at Trade Day. So welcome, everyone. We're going to go through our usual regular run through in here today with the slight change, the slight twist for a Monday and that we look at the shape of the week, you know, the bigger picture, what's happened, what's been going on over the past week, what are the, what's the outlook for the next week, what are the major fundamental macroeconomic geopolitical events that are shaping markets right now. Um, good morning for, to Texas. Okay, hi there. Morning, Tony. Um, so we're going to go for our usual regular run through in here today, um, for starting off with the uh, bigger picture, what's happened, what we've got coming up. So I think the headline says it all. So this you can remember download. This is the macroeconomic um um uh weekly recap and update that i put up on the members area in the research department where you see those technical analysis reports you'll see this um as well uh, goes up usually on a sunday i put it up um and the headline really says it all fed pivot weak data better tech earnings still risk on we're in risk on risk on meaning traders investors willing to take more risk you know basically bullish for equities um, in here, bearish for the dollar um, in this instance. And what we're seeing is here, Fed pivot. What's that? Well, last week, there was a definite kind of shift or the market perceived the shift, even if it wasn't meant to be a shift. These things don't happen by accident, though, right? Powell hasn't made a mistake here. You know, they, they obviously are very careful about what they say and what they publish. So um, there was seen as a, a slight move from a not necessarily a dovish move, but um, a less hawkish move. Um, um, with uh, respect to uh, where they're going with rates, how aggressively, where the peak in rates might be, and then maybe even how soon they're going to start to cut. And we're focused a lot, and I'm not going to go for it in loads of detail because I've been focusing on it a lot. Um, but in here, so this is the next meeting, 70 um, percent chance of a uh, of only a 50 basis point hike. So moderating the rate hikes, that's one of the um, factors. Two, if we go out to the December meeting, we now see the peak in rates at the 325 to 350 area. So that's only 100 basis points um, up from now. So the likelihood is we have three meetings to the end of the year, September, November, December. So likelihood 50, 25, 25, right? So we're looking for that, only a, a peak in rates. That's the best um, um, chance in here, 48% uh, of that. And also 33% that doesn't even go that high by the end of the year, okay? So it's over, like this. these two added in here come to over 80%, that when the, the peak in rates is going to be below 325, 325, 350 or below. And if we move into next year, then still at 325, 350, but then that's February. Come May though, um, so no meetings in March and April come uh, sorry that's excuse me forget that come March we're still at 325 excuse me scrub that 325 350 but then no meeting in April come May okay we then had 300 325 so somewhere but, and there's an expectation going into the May meeting we're going to be getting a rate cut okay so the peak in rates potentially coming lower and then also the rate cuts may be coming earlier than we would have thought even um, up to uh, beginning of last week uh, pre the Fed meeting. So that's the pivot. OK, um, and that's becoming because because the that we are seeing some some signs within the so the headline inflation data is still very high, but we're seeing some signs within the um, within some of the data, some of the inflation data, both in the mostly in the US, OK, because we're concentrating in the US, but we're also seeing it globally as well. There was an article um, in here um, in the Times uh, about has peak inflation already hit in the UK. And remember, the UK went on its rate hikes, hiking cycle, hasn't been as aggressive as the Fed, but it went on its rate hiking cycle before the Fed. The first hike in the UK here was before the Fed. It was the end of last year. The Fed did their lift off the beginning of 2022. First rate hike in the UK came in uh, December 2021. So, um, and we've still got very high inflation. We've got some of the highest inflation on the planet um, amongst the OECD, the big uh, G10 countries. But nevertheless, in here, um, there's some signs in the UK of some of the data coming through showing um, an easing of inflationary pressures. And remember, these inflationary pressures are global inflationary pressures. They're not confined to any um, one country. So, um, what was, it, what was it? Where was I? Where was I? So what I was saying, well, yes, yeah, so we've had this some signs of the inflation data sign, but certainly seeing a lot of the data coming through is showing signs of the economy slowing. So the fear is obviously we're going to go into a slowdown. And that came through in the U US last week, the GDP data. Now, GDP is very backward looking data, but in GDP data showing a contraction of 0.9 percent in the Q2 um, with a consensus for an increase of 0.5. So, you know, significant slowdown in data, softer data. 
um, Fed pivoting. And then the other really um, good factor last week in here that helped markets stay in that risk on move was the Alphabet and Amazon particularly, but a lot of the um, new media tech sector reporting um, either inline or better than consensus data, um, earnings numbers, revenues numbers, profit numbers, and also the guidance was particularly good from Alphabet and Amazon. Um, you know, Nasdaq jumped 4% that day. Um, and we ended up having in here a highlight uh, for both European and um, to, to a lesser extent Asian, but certainly European and US stock indices posted their best up months since 2020. Since so the recovery that we saw after the post pandemic, after the pandemic sell off, the post pandemic, or it wasn't post pandemic, it was still within the pandemic, but the rebound that we saw in 2020 um, is the best monthly um, gains in here since then. US 10 year yields continuing to push lower. Uh, we're way below 3% now, went below the May yield lows. That was important. If I guess we'll go down. Um, you see in the chart there, okay, we went below the May yield loads, okay, um, last week. Uh, the dollar has already started turning. The dollar went even lower, dollar weakening, because there's an anticipation of lower yields going forward. And obviously, this base and this recovery, we're seeing the S&P. And gold has put in a base as well. As the dollar rolls lower, remember, inverse correlation between gold and the dollar, um, we've seen a move uh, up in gold, okay? So all of those things. Um, and copper, this was a really important one as well. In here, let me see if I can show you the, the copper chart that I look at where am I going to find it easily and quickly hopefully um where are we in here this is some analysis I was doing earlier on today um but here if I put the weekly chart on and copper boom so copper had a real indecisive the week before and I was flagging to some of my fund manager clients in here. This was the one market that hadn't turned when everything you know, two weeks ago, this hadn't turned. You know, we had a big uh, in the uh, middle week of um, July, second week of July, we had a big down move. Wednesday, uh, sorry, Wednesday. Um, the third week of July, we in the middle of July week, we didn't really see a big rebound. But then last week, a massive rebound in copper, really strong um, week in um, for, uh, for copper in here, um, and creating a basing pattern in here. You can see it on the daily chart. Really strong base now, a really strong recovery effort um, for copper. And that um, came late. So copper, remember, copper are a reflection of the global economy. So signs of potential recovery, a better um, uh, recovery aspect for the global economy, looking further out and looking forward. So that's um, um, a positive as well for this whole risk on theme. Right. Let's go to where we are going into this week. Obviously, we've got... Um, war in Ukraine, but that's really um, uh, a backstory now, really not impacting markets um, at all at the moment. Uh, we have the RBA, it's probably not going to interest most of you too much in here unless you're trading the currencies. Reserve Bank of Australia rate decision on Tuesday, we're getting that effectively overnight, okay? And then we get the Bank of England on Thursday, a bigger than um, previous rate hike expected from the Bank of England, but also potential for some future guidance from the Bank of England saying maybe we're getting to the end of this rate hiking cycle. So we'll certainly be watching that for that. Um, going into today, we've got some big data for today, um, which is we've had already had out of Europe um, and Asia. We've had the S&P Global, um, so S&P Global I, um, PMI, manufacturing PMI data in here. Um, actually worse than expected so far. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we get the uh, from the US, the more watched, you do get this same, this S&P Global data for the US, but the more watched data is the ISM data, the Institute of Supply Management. PMI is important. Why is PMI important? Purchasing managers index. These are the people, purchasing managers, working in corporates, looking up and down the supply chain, making decisions uh, by looking both ways on the supply chain. So they're important. It's a very, very good lead indicator. I've probably bored you guys with this already. But I had a very esteemed colleague when I worked at Credit Suisse called Jonathan Wilmot, a strategist who put decades into studying this. And basically, there's a very high correlation about future growth rates, future inflation rates, future um, um, market um, future performance rates for the economy. Um, 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 as a lead indicator, PMI is a great lead indicator because these guys, remember, this is a survey. This is a decision. This is a feeling. How are they feeling about what is their outlook like for their um, for their particular sectors. And it's looking at all sectors of the economy um, from a corporate level. So um, it's a really good lead indicator to where the market's going to be, or not where the market's going to be, where the economy could be in two to three months' time, and therefore where the market is going to be right now, okay? So because the market always, remember, leads the economy. So, um, yeah, PMI data, very important. RBA decision, as I said before, looking at the shape of the week here. We get the, um, the, the composite 
um, and services PMI from S&P Global for the rest of the planet um, on uh, Wednesday. And then the ISM data um, coming through uh, for the US also on Wednesday. That Bank of England uh, rate decision on Thursday and the always much watched US employment report on Friday. If you're trading dollar versus the Canadian dollar, <laughs> sorry, guys. We get double whammy on Friday, both the US and Canadian employment reports. This here is a mistake. Copied and pasted that in again for some reason. So there we go. Um, that's what we've got coming up for the shape of the week. Let's take a look at the daily calendar. Now, we have had this PMI data out of Europe, kind of mixed bag so far in here. French manufacturing PMI missed. German slightly better, but you know, slight miss by hardly anything on the uh, French data, a slight beat on the uh, German data and um, a, a slight beat on the euro-wide data and a slight miss on the um, UK data in here. Remember with this data in here, we do get the flash PMI data and that is 80%. We get that at the end of the month. We would have had that last week, I think. So the flash PMI data has about 80, 90%, I think, of the surveys complete. So often we already know approximately where this data is going to be. So it's rarely that it's a big surprise, this data, as it comes in. And it's just offline in here. So you've got mixed in here so far this morning. We do get the, uh, the S&P Global Manufacturing PMI 945 Eastern. But the more watch data is the ISM data, which comes at 10 o'clock Eastern today. We are certainly going to be watching out for that. Consensus estimates for the ISM manufacturing P PMI are 52.0. So watching that, that's going to be the critical data for today. Right. Earnings, earnings. Now, earnings, we are pretty much over the hump, guys, of um, having seen um, the major earnings, OK, for uh, uh, for this for this cycle, for, the, for this quarter. Um, there is more stuff in here. I'll put the filter on and we'll go through um the bigger stuff in here but i haven't really featured it in the document to, um because we're really over the hump none of these that we have left coming up are really going to impact what we're looking for in here you guys we're not here with trade day trading the individual stocks we're trading the indices we're looking at what's going to impact the major indices and really we've covered most of the stuff i will pick out a couple of things in here though i don't think there's anything in there today that's really big the one i'm going to pick out here is caterpillar OK, Caterpillar is often seen as a barometer, a reflection of the um, the construction industry in the US. OK, so that will be interesting to see how that goes. Caterpillar. OK, that's going to be one we we'll probably want to watch going into Tuesday, moving through the week, maybe CVS Health. OK, um, watching out for that. It's a big, obviously a big corporate. Um, yeah. And then the rest of it, I don't think and when I look previously, nothing really yeah, it tails off, really. So nothing really significant, I think, um, coming up for the balance of the week. Um, um, we're really past the main major stage. We've had all those big corporate earnings that we're going to see um, going into uh, the balance of the week. So, yeah, um, we're over the hump OK, um, of the major earnings. Right. Let's take a look at five things to start your day out of Bloomberg. Nothing much in here of real. The main thing, the European factory activity it says plunged in here. Right. So this is talking about the PMI data. Right. Asian manufacturing output continued to weaken in July. Well, yeah, they continue to weaken. Um, but we saw in here, if we look at when we look at the data, it's actually mixed. Yeah, so they were weaker than, you know, they're, they're below 50. When these numbers are below 50, it's showing weakening. Um, and most of them are below 50. But then again, they're actually mixed. OK, some are beating expectations. So they're in, re in relation to expectations, they're not far off expectations. OK, um, gold, there's a trial going on. Um, former head of precious metals at JP Morgan doesn't interest us. Um, a survey about Elon Musk selling his stock doesn't interest us. European stocks um, have rebounded, but U.S. equity futures have slipped slightly. So uh, we'll move on to talk a little bit about that. So U.S. equity futures, but they says like fall. Well, they're hardly falling. They're hot, considering the rally we had last week. OK, um, Fed officials reinforced tighter policy messages on the weekend. Oh, yeah, we did have um, I think it was Kashkari um, over the weekend. Where is that? Um, so, yeah, I think this is true. I think this this paragraph here, traders are speculating that Federal Reserve will tone down its anti-inflation campaign up for a slower path of rate hikes after data showed the U.S. economy shrank a second quarter. OK, so I think what's important here is Fed speakers. It's going to be a lot about Fed speakers. Is the Fed pivot real? How, are they becoming less um, hawkish, so de facto more dovish? Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important. I think it was Kashkari over the weekend that we had in here. They don't seem to... The dollar fair, I can't see where it is, but I think it was Kashkari um, speaking over the weekend. 
Um, don't see there. But we're certainly going to be having to watch out for Fed speakers as we go through the week. Um, as you see in here, I don't see anything scheduled um, for today. Um, and then nothing much more in five things to start your day. So futures have, have had a slight dip in here this morning. Um, what else will I have for you in here? Bank of England. Okay, so Bank of England set for this biggest rate rise in uh, 27 years in here. So um, looking for a, um, a bigger rate hike than previous. Okay, um, but then really the potential for um, uh, so a 50 basis point hike. You know, having previously have been raising rates at 25s. Okay, in, in in the UK, but you know it could be interesting to see if they do a bigger rate hike and then indicate maybe there's going to be a slowing down. Okay, so it's going to be critical going into this week. That's bigger picture going for the week. Um, European shares rise. Okay, so as banks HSBC offset week data. So we have positive data going back to the earnings. You can see in here HSBC. This is going to be the European, uh, sorry, the US leg. But uh, oh, I think I unticked the box. If I go to, I think quoted in the UK. Um, HSBC, will we see it here? Yeah, HSBC, here we go here. So you can see here, beating expectations, HSBC, uh, large retail and investment bank. And um, so that um, helping the whole banking sector and says offsets weak data. Well, the data we've already looked at, the data they're talking about there is that PMI data and that PMI data not particularly uh, negative in here. Factory has be contracted yet. Contracted, it was below 50, but equally um, beating expectations. German retail sales, we did have actually a post biggest year on year slump since 1994. So we see that in here, German retail sales. That was a big, that was quite a negative. Okay, so we can't ignore that one. That one was definitely was a negative. But, you know, um, European shares have actually up. Uh, so if we go and take, just skip ahead, European stock indices slightly better uh, on the whole. Um, if you look at the German index in here, up a third of a percent. Uh, the French index about the same. Um, the FTSE 100 about the same as well. So about a third for the major European indices going into this morning. Whereas if we look at the US stock um, uh, futures in here, we're down about whether you know, the Dow's only down a tenth. We're about a quarter percent down on the S&P and the NASDAQ going in today. It's hardly a fall, right? It's hardly falling out of bed. OK, I'm going to turn our attention to the stocks. And if anything, actually, we've had a dip and a rebound in here. You can see the S&P were actually lower earlier overnight and we're actually pushing back high. Interesting here. We did this analysis last week. The down leg from uh, March through mid-June. The market stopped almost exactly at the 50% retracement there on Friday, okay? And we're hovering just below that, okay? That comes in um, at around 41, 38, 39 kind of area. The peak from Friday was 41, 44. I think, you know, I'm going to be playing this from the long side. We've already had a dip and we're rebounding on the intraday. Um, and if we go take a look at the NASDAQ in here, NASDAQ managed to overcome this peak in here, this important, uh, this is the early June peak. That was up at 12,973 and three quarters. On Friday, we got above that, um, up as high as uh, through 13,000. And again, look, a really resilient, a little dip and a little rebound here is hardly down. And um, this is setting up for this cluster of resistances here. So having cleared that peak there, I think the real, come back to the S&P in a minute, guys, but I think the important area is these two retracements. You see, it's the 38.2% I've got here of the, oh no, I've moved that, of the whole sell-off from the uh, high here, from the actually the end of last year. The 38.2% of that um, is uh, um, around 13,150. And the 50% of the down leg from late March through mid-June is, um, the 50% is 13, like 200. So 150, 200, a real potential target early this week, potentially today, I think. You know, that will be my target area going into today. Uh, we'll step into the 15 minute and you can see like they're saying, oh, you know, down, but I mean, here's the dip in here um, from um, overnight, it's 15 minute chart. I'm gonna get rid of all this old analysis. But it's hardly a big sell off in here. The market's already started to rebound, it dipped overnight, dipped again in European hours and rebounding already. I mean, I think back above that little high there, is going to be a bullish signal, um, which is 12,967. Okay, and we're flirting just below there. So up through 12,967 looks bullish. And if I'm going to put the fib on of just the up leg that we saw Friday, okay, so this is Friday's up leg. Okay. Uh, 
here's Friday's up leg. Let me just snap that to the right levels. Just going to pull this down a little bit in here. Okay, you can see we're pretty much holding around the 38.2. It's been flirting around that 38.2 and then coming back off of it. So the 38.2 is the first like proper, you know, proper in inverted um, commas, inverted quotes. So, you know, this kind of holding at that support level. And actually now we're already punching through that resistance. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is a bull trigger. I'll be putting the, the, the trigger to be long on this already on the NASDAQ. If we look at the daily on the S&P, we've already looked at there and um, the market just stalling at this 50% retracement. If we go, I've got five minutes here. I'm going to just zoom out of that to 15. But you can see in here, I'm going to get rid of all this old. But again, just the up leg. We look at just the up leg from Friday. This is just Friday's up move. In here, the market actually holding around the 50% retracement of that up move and already back high and then already above that little swing high there. So I think this is all looking bullish already in here, guys. And those upside targets have already flagged. I think they're real potentials going into today. Um, I could only play this at the moment from the long side. Let's take a look at oil and gold. So first of all, oil in here, still caught in this sign of sideways erratic range. I've got no strong, I mean, bigger picture, I'm bearish. It's been flirting with this downtrend line that comes from the middle of June, okay? Um, Thursday and then Friday way above that had a big failure candlestick in here really negative took out the peak here but failed but just below these peaks over here these peaks are up at 102 um, and the market failed at like 101.88 so failing at, got above this that was important to get above there but it failed at 102.00 coming back from 101.88 big failure candlestick down in here this morning I have to play it from the short side and if we go in here you know look so this is kind of a topping pattern, right? And it's sitting right on the support, that low there. 96.04, down through there, this looks like it could really see a more significant sell. So 96.04, the level on the downside for oil. Let's take a look at gold in here. And I think, let me just double check it here. I think you need to roll the month here on gold. Just bear with me. Any uh, big gold traders? What guys? What are you trading on gold, guys, at the moment on the front months? Are you out on deck now? Any gold traders? Oh, G. Oh, G. I'm looking at GM there, thinking that was gold. GM's good morning. <laughs> hi, Tim. Hi, Clinton. Hi, Kaz. Again, again. Hi, Tony. Um, okay, I think we're on. Um, I'll go and have a look up. But I think we're on. I've got us on the August contract in here. I think we're on front month being a deck now. There's the front month. I'm going to put the deck one in and see what we look like on the uh, shorter time time frame. See what the liquidity is like. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, there's a 15 minute chart. So we're on deck now. So I'm going to put in that one as well. So I'll do that again. So we've got gold on the deck. And on the deck, oops, why has that gone there? This needs to be over here. Okay, just make this bigger again. Just bear with me. Um, so I put in the daily. And I'm going to get rid of the old ones on gold. Just bear with me, guys. Just want to tidy this up. Gold, gold. Okay, that's good. So here's the daily on gold. It's looking positive. Remember, inverse relationship. I've been building this space up again in here this morning. Inverse relationship with um, the dollar. Dollars drifting lower. Here's the dollar going down. Inverse relationship. Bearish dollar, bullish gold. Pushing higher again, going to the 15 minute. Yeah, I mean, we're sitting like it's been a, a, a strong move higher already this morning. Now we're in this like, flag pattern. So you've got this kind of flag pole, boom, flagging. And then, you know, potential for the, to replicate this. Or you could argue we've had a pole there, flagged. We've already had the next pole, next flag. So maybe this distance here. So it could easily jump in here. This has jumped 1781 to 1790. Another eight, nine, 10 bucks to the upside is a potential today. Yeah, so maybe up into, you know, where are we? 90, maybe above 1800 today is a, as an upside target on gold. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. Any questions? Anything? If nothing comes through. I'm going to wrap it up there. I'm going to wish you all a great trading day. Stay safe, and I'll be back with you with another Bull versus Bear webinar tomorrow.